Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Great Lakes Lecture Series. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce you today uh, to Dr. Shalisa Moore, who is an assistant professor at James Madison College, uh, where she teaches on energy policy, which you're going to be hearing a lot about today. Uh, her research is also in energy policy. Uh, specifically, a part of it is to do with uh, interesting decisions and uh, uh, policy decisions made by uh, people in power, such as the government, and also citizens, and how that affects power, production, and consumption. Uh, also, she regularly interacts with engineers about social policy decisions and how that can affect uh, and bring about new technologies. So thank you very much for being with us today, uh, Shalisa, and I will hand over the mic to you now. Uh, just one thing, if we can go to the, I think it's up on the thing there. Just change it there. There we go. I just wanted to also say thank you very much to the Michigan State University uh, Library. Uh, Terence O'Neill and Paul Cooper here have uh, uh, enabled this setup, this 360 setup, which we're going to be actually utilizing more than ever today. And also Dr. Elias Aidi uh, for doing the social media setup. So thank you very much to MSU as well. So I will hand over this to you. I will remute it for a second for you. All right, good evening, everyone. I'm really excited to be here, and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm going to be talking about a research project that um, I've been working on for the last year on solar development on agricultural lands. And I want to acknowledge that I've been working on this with a team of excellent student experts from James Madison College who have done a fantastic job. So we've interviewed 60 stakeholders in the state of Michigan about their perspectives on solar development on ag lands and on pollinator habitat. So I'm going to present a couple slides to start. So I argue that we need a complete transformation of our electricity system, and there are a number of reasons why. So one is that our existing infrastructure is aging. It's already pretty depreciated. We've really gotten all of the costs that we anticipated to get out of it. And so it's already time to replace that infrastructure, and we might as well replace it with clean energy. A second reason is that our dirty fossil fuel based energy infrastructure causes a lot of local air pollution and that can exacerbate health conditions like asthma and it also um, causes water pollution. Then third, a lot of these dirty energy facilities are sited or located in low income communities that have been marginalized and it's time to end that extractive resource relationship. So fourth, you've probably heard that General Motors has announced that it's moving from internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles. And so we're going to need clean electricity to power those electric vehicles. And then finally, we have some aggressive climate change goals that we need to meet. So by 2030, we need to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions, almost cut them in half from what we were emitting in 2010. So 45% by 2010. And by 2050, we need to reach net zero emissions. And that's to say at 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. So our utility companies have already started to work on these uh, renewable energy goals. So they plan to have all coal-fired electricity retired by 2040. And I believe that we will meet that goal and maybe even beat that goal. So this is a picture of a coal-fired power plant that is being uh, taken apart in Muskegon, Michigan. Consumers Energy, in its last uh, proposal for new power plant infrastructure to the Utility Commission, set a goal of siting of developing 6,000 megawatts of solar power, which is a lot, over about the next decade. DTE, which is our other major investor-owned utility, set a goal of 80% carbon reduction by 2040. And they also seek to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And we hope that in DTE's next proposal to the Utility Commission, we'll see um, some aggressive renewable energy goals like we saw from consumers. 
Um, we also have a goal from the governor to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. And we have a number of cities in the state that are setting 100% uh, setting renewable energy goals. So where are we going to put this renewable energy? How are we going to scale it up? How will we do it fast enough? Who will own it? What business models will we use to approach it? And so I'm going to show a couple 360 degree videos that I made for this space uh, for teaching students and the public about the energy system. And then we'll switch back to talking more about the specifics of solar on agricultural land. Solar, they think, an example of Michigan is a solar, just a bit outside. 
Utility-scale solar module prices have fallen dramatically over the past decade, from between $3.50 and $4 per watt in 2008, to below $1 per watt in 2013, to $0.35 per watt in 2017. The reasons why relates to the global scale, not the local and state scale. Those reasons include an increase in polysilicate production and availability, technological advances in manufacturing and cell efficiency, consolidation in the sector, and Chinese industrial policy that flooded the international market with cheap panels. 90% of the Michigan public supports more solar energy use in Michigan. However, public support can wane when specific concrete projects are proposed. Moreover, public support might hinge on who owns solar power and the size, which can range from a few panels to thousands of acres. With utility scale solar power plants, large photovoltaic panels are sited in mass, covering large land footprint. The electricity is then sold to the grid. There are about 64 megawatts of utility-scale solar in Michigan. Installations of one megawatt or greater are shown on this map. The largest solar power plant in Michigan is currently under construction in Shiawassee County. The $250 million solar project is called Assembly Solar. At 239 megawatts, it will more than quadruple the amount of utility-scale solar in the state. By comparison, the solar installation shown here is 1 megawatt. The policies that support this type of solar are largely made at the state and local level. In 2017, utility company Consumers Energy filed an integrated resource plan that surprisingly excluded new natural gas generation, instead calling for 6,000 megawatts of utility-scale solar. This will require tens of thousands of acres of land, including agricultural land. For example, the 239-megawatt assembly solar plant is being built on 1,900 acres that was mostly farmland or vacant land. Consumers' current plan is likely just the first wave of demand for agricultural land for solar siting. Plus, there are demands for land for other types of renewable energy generation, such as cellulosic biofuel crops and wind power plants. Community solar, also called solar garden, is the second type of solar generation. The Birchland Park Community Solar Project in East Lansing, see here, is about one third of a megawatt and includes 1,000 solar panels. With community solar, customers do not need suitable space at their home or apartment for solar panels and can access solar energy without paying for a residential installation. The project was built on a retired garbage dump, and experts from the Michigan Wildflower Farm planted pollinator friendly plants. A nonprofit organization called Michigan Energy Option initiated the project. Since it doesn't pay taxes, Michigan Energy Options can't benefit from the tax credits for solar installation, but it can facilitate development for citizens and other organizations. For renewable energy barriers, I think financial is a huge thing, but also society, so you can think of um, solar and wind. You can't just put that anywhere. For solar, you have to consider shade and the orientation. So in Michigan, they've got to be south facing to get the ideal sun exposure and generate the most they can. And we went through a little bit of that with our community solar project. So that has been cited over on the capped landfill, um, which is interesting because the land can technically not be produced for anything or developed, just that was a little more. It was an open field that we were able to put solar on, but I mean, people don't want to turn every field into a solar farm. 
In another example, the Marquette Board of Light and Power had the UK's first community solar garden. The O'Shea Solar Installation is a community solar project owned by utility company DTE. Assembly solar will be 10 times this power capacity. Some DTE customers can buy into this and other renewable energy projects on their utility bill. Initially, project developers did not consult the local community, and the project was set to replace a beloved but condemned community center without benefiting the local community. Negotiations with local stakeholders yielded several community benefits. A lease payment from DTE to the city of Detroit allowed the city to restore part of the park for public use. It also provided local electrician apprentice jobs and home energy audits for surrounding houses. In some cases, solar power goes to specific organizations such as a university or company. Michigan State University has installed 10 megawatts of solar over its parking lot. This reduces the imbalance between the high demand for electricity compared to steam from the campus power plant. Such installations at workplaces could also provide future clean electric vehicle charging. The third type of solar power is what most people probably envision when they think of solar, residential solar panels on rooftops and in backyards. With this model, private citizens own the solar generation. 61% of the Michigan public thinks that a mix of private citizens, utility companies, and leasing companies should own the solar panels. Only 9% of the public think that utility companies alone should own the solar generation. There's more than enough solar energy to power the world renewably today, and yet we don't do it. There are a couple of reasons why we don't do it. The first is cost, and the second is with difficulty of deployment. So the first part of our research is actually made traditional solar cells lower cost. But in addition to that, we've developed entirely these transparent photovoltaics. By harvesting the invisible light, we can make solar cells that are completely clear and invisible to the human eye. And so we can deploy it in places like buildings and windows, in automobiles, in greenhouses, um, in mobile electronics, or anywhere where we care about the underlying aesthetics, even places like advertising or displays. We don't see it as the only solution, but we see it as a really important and complementary approach to traditional solar cells. And so where we can deploy traditional solar cells, we should, but where we don't want to take up extra land. This is a technology that can help us generate electricity renewably close to where we're actually utilizing it. 
Since the sun does not always shine and the wind does not always blow, storage technology will be needed to achieve a 100% renewable energy future so that electricity does not always have to be consumed at the same moment it is produced. The existing lighting system pumped hydroelectric facility stores energy by using it to pump water up hills when there is surplus electricity available, and then release it to generate hydroelectricity during peak hours of demand. Based on the input from the signal, we plan on replacing the majority of our generation of solar, and we believe we can make that work. So the use build out on solar, the wind regimes in Michigan are not the most productive, so we do have a segment of wind on another 500 megawatts or so that will be on the wind over the next couple of years, and after that it's going to be a lot of solar. The jewel or the gem of the state of Michigan is our lighting so many times in this system discussion, we talk about storage. You know, if we could just store the energy from these intermittent renewables, then you could solve all the problems. Well, we, we did that many years ago when we built Ludington Pump Storage. It's a big battery. It's much larger capacity than lithium-ion batteries. We operate it, but it's co-owned with Detroit Edison, so both of us can use that in Colorado, Michigan. And we envision that is our big battery that's going to Help our system and be able to bring on large amounts of energy renewables for the next several uh, decades to come. As we've seen in other cases of Energy 360, the Ludington facility provides sanctuary for birds and ducks, including the American bald eagle and the double crested cormorant. At Michigan State University, researchers are working on new solar energy and storage technologies to contribute to the energy transition. I work in environmental engineering, so what I'm interested in is the environmental impact of energy uh, production and consumption, and how, um, as we include more and more renewable, like what would be the impact on the environment in general. And my main area of research is solar energy, but my research has extended to include other type of energy because a lot of times you cannot just have like a solar system, you need to have battery storage or you need to understand how the grid works or other source of energy. You pretty much need energy for doing any products, so I have a project on asphalt. I'm actually from India. When I was doing my master's, I was doing it in environmental engineering where we were focusing more on water treatment, wastewater treatment. But what I realized was a lot of the problems that we have in India is coming from energy and electricity production. We have a lot of, we had a lot of coal. Now we are going for renewables. An electric vehicle battery has multiple modules comprised of individual cells. The researchers have been testing the cells for two years for their usefulness in different applications. But because the tests are accelerated, this actually shows the battery's performance over five years in a vehicle. One of their goals is to understand whether it would be more environmentally beneficial to send the batteries immediately to recycling or to use them for energy storage and then recycle them. We are testing some old electric vehicle batteries. The thing what we first found out was that we have still 80% of the capacity in these batteries left. That was the first test we did just to see if there is enough energy capacity in them. We are testing them for a couple of applications. One would be residential storage, one is a fast charging storage, and um, we have different types of cycling that are going on. From the software, I'm able to see uh, how uh, the battery is degrading over time, how the capacity is basically changing over all the test duration. The researchers have been surprised by how well the battery cells are doing. Thank you. Um, 
So hopefully that gave you a good overview of solar energy in Michigan. And so in the next part, I'm going to focus on the research I've been doing on the first type of solar discussed in the video, which is large scale utility scale solar sited uh, potentially on agricultural land. So I wanted to understand some of the benefits and drawbacks of siting solar power on agricultural land. So from the developer's perspective, um, there are a lot of engineering suitability reasons for building solar power on ag land. So this previously tilled agricultural land is already devoid of rocks, um, and removing rocks from a site can actually be a big upfront crop, uh, cost. It doesn't have any trees, it's, it's um, not forested, and it provides large acres of flat contiguous land. So that's one reason. A second that's very crucial is that there is typically access to transmission lines near agricultural lands. And transmission lines you can think of as the electricity highways, taking the electrons from where they're generated in the power plant to where they're consumed in your house or business. So um, every extra mile a project has to go to reach transmission adds about a million dollars in project costs. So really lining up the site and the transmission access is one of the biggest drivers of costs in the project. So third, there's already existing drainage, drain tiles and drain pipes, um, which you see in this picture here and also on this side. And that's really important so that the solar site doesn't flood. And then finally, compared to some other types of land, such as forested land or state parks, agricultural land has lesser environmental impacts and conflicts with endangered species. So those are the development reasons for doing this. Um, so long ago, Michigan already made the decision to allow wind power on our preserved farmlands. So we have a, a act called Public Act 116 or PA 116, which is our Preserved Farmland Act. And basically farmers can opt into PA 116 for a duration from 10 to 90 years and they keep that land in farmland production and they receive a tax credit for doing so. And with wind, you can still farm around the turbines, but with solar, it's more exclusive. So there are questions about whether that would be appropriate to allow it on PA 116 lands. And we talked to the members of this work group and they said they worked very collaboratively. Nobody was really trying to block it, but the biggest concern would be that the farmers would both get their tax credit for PA 116 lands and that they would get the lease payment for allowing solar on their property from the solar company. And people saw that as double dipping. So what they decided to do was to put the PA116 commitment on hold if somebody leases their land for solar. And uh, it would just be paused and the tax credit would be paused for the 30 year solar lease. And then afterwards, it would potentially return to farming and the rest of the PA116 commitment would be fulfilled. Another thing that the work group decided to do was to include a requirement for pollinator habitat for any solar sited on PA116 lands. And I should mention when I say sited, I mean located, the place that it is situated within the landscape, um, literally where it goes geographically. So the work group members saw this as a win-win because we know there's sometimes public opposition to renewable energy because people don't like the way it looks, it's aesthetics and that by planting pollinator plants underneath the solar panels, it would beautify the site and increase community concept, uh, acceptance. That was basically the argument. So coming out of this, our interviews found that there was a lot of misunderstanding. So one was that a site, a solar site, would be completely on PA116, high quality preserved farmland. That's unlikely to be the case. Typically what happens is that there's one um, there are two different parcels of land and then a little bit of PA116 land in the middle. And to have a contiguous site, you need a little bit of that preserved farmland. And then the second concern we heard is whether or not the site will actually return to agriculture at the end of the lease. And that was a little bit unknown. At some point, the farmer has to fulfill the rest of the PA116 time that they've signed up for. Whether or not they could renew the lease once before doing that seems to be a point of confusion across stakeholders. So then third, people and communities really worry that maybe the solar company will go bankrupt and the solar panels will be left on the site. But this has been addressed by requiring the solar companies put a bond in place 
so that the money is there up front if something goes wrong, or to make sure that um, if something doesn't go wrong, that at the end of the useful life of the equipment, it is definitely removed. So that's a big concern, but it's something that has been already addressed. And then finally, there's a lot of confusion about, or just a lot of uncertainty about whether the solar facility will benefit the soil. So some people argue because you have this large site that won't have pesticide use or much herbicide use, it would kind of allow the soil to rest and actually help to preserve the farmland because using it for solar means it's not going to be developed for condominiums or something like that. But other people were, were uh, worried that siting solar would cause a lot of soil compaction from driving equipment over it. And that's something that has not really uh, been sufficiently determined in the scientific literature. So I want to talk a little bit more about this idea of pollinator habitat, which is both very exciting and very complex. So there are really good reasons for trying to incentivize the development of more uh, pollinator habitat on the landscape. So you probably know that our pollinators are gravely under threat. They're mainly under threat through habitat loss. And so adding some uh, forage for these pollinators, some flowers to this site, is going to help with that lack of habitat. So second, there are a lot of issues with loss of pollinators from neonicotinoid pesticide use in row crop farming, such as soybeans. So this would provide landscape for pollinators where there's not any pesticide use. Since it wouldn't be needed for solar, it's needed for agriculture. And then another reason that pollinators are under threat is because of parasites and pathogens that attack um, honeybee colonies. So lots of increased threats to pollinators and very important reasons to ensure that our pollinator species can recover and thrive. On the solar side, however, this does increase the costs of the facility and it increases the complexity of the projects. So we heard, we talked to a lot of different experts in this area, and we heard a lot of concerns about site preparation. So if you don't prepare the site correctly for the seed, the seed is unlikely to take and you will have wasted a lot of money. And the seed mixes can cost anywhere from a couple hundred dollars an acre to thousands of dollars an acre. So if you bought the really expensive one, you didn't do your site prep well, you might have just lost a big upfront cost. There are also a lot of questions, since this is fairly new, about how you do maintenance on these sites. And maybe it reduces mowing costs, but what other types of maintenance and herbicides you need to use to make sure the site doesn't go back to grass and is not taken over by invasive species. And then finally, it has to be very well planned to benefit pollinators to make sure that you have, for instance, blooms at all different times of the summer, from the spring to the early to late fall. So the other issue with this pollinator habitat requirement is that if it's not carefully communicated to stakeholders, there might be a lot of mistaken um, understandings and there might be a lot of disappointed expectations. So one thing we found was a common expectation is that these pollinator habitats would substantially benefit pollinator dependent crops in Michigan or elsewhere. And what we found is that that's actually pretty doubtful because not all of our crops require pollination and most of the land being selected for solar is near row crop farms such as soybean and corn, which don't require pollination and not near high value fruit and vegetable crops. The drawback with deciding um, to site the solar power near these pollinator dependent crops is you're then uh, trying to consume high value agricultural land and you're going to have a lot of land use conflicts in terms of that. And one thing that we found in the scientific literature and papers in this is that uh, most of that literature doesn't think about these more logistical and stakeholder perceptions issues. And that's something we really need to be thinking about. Another area we found for potential misunderstandings is that in some states, these are classified as livestock. And that's true in Michigan. In Oregon, they work to um, classify growing bees, honeybees, raising honeybees on solar sites and to classify that as an agricultural use. And um, that makes a lot of sense because beekeeping is agricultural. It's very arduous work. Um, and there's a big need for clean, healthy forage for these pollinators. However, a lot of stakeholders in Oregon who didn't want to see agricultural land used for solar 
saw this as a disingenuous framing. And then finally, one of the concerns is that people will expect that within the first couple years, these pollinator habitats will look like the beautiful Audubon calendar in July. And in fact, it's going to take a while for them to establish, and they won't necessarily always look like this uh, site I had a couple slides uh, earlier where you see these very beautiful flowers. That doesn't mean that it's not high quality habitat for the pollinators. So a couple examples of this, the Bircham Park installation you saw in part of Energy 360 does have pollinator plantings on it, but it's still early on. They're working to get them to take off. And so when I look at this site, I don't really see it as a pollinator, as a layperson, since I'm not actually a pollinator expert, I'm an energy expert. I don't see it as a, a pollinator site. That's not obvious to me as a layperson. And then we see the Detroit, um, the DTE O'Shea solar farm that you saw a little bit more of in Energy 360. And when I saw this, I thought maybe there were weeds growing out of control on the site, but this is actually very rich, high quality pollinator habitat. And bees in the D, is, they are growing, um, they're raising honeybees there, and they actually had a bumper crop of honey a year earlier than they ever thought they would have honey production from a new set of hives. So this is very high quality pollinator habitat, but it doesn't necessarily look like people would expect. So when we assume that this pollinator habitat will reduce stakeholder conflict, we need to think through all of these issues and make sure that we communicate, educate, and engage people so that they understand what to expect. Another hot topic right now is called agrivoltaics. So combining solar photovoltaics with agricultural use on the site, growing crops underneath the solar panels or nearby the solar panels. There's not a lot of research yet on what the best crops will be. We're starting to do more research. The National Renewable Energy Lab is doing fantastic work in this area, but it's still pretty early on. So people should set their expectations that this is not something that will happen right away. There's also a lot of discussion about grazing sheep and cattle on these sites. And um, we have to take into account then the cost of raising the solar panels. So for cattle, they need to be at eight or nine feet. Well, one of the challenges is uh, you add a lot of steel to the cost, and more so you add a lot of costs of labor because you have to have people who are very skilled at climbing up ladders to be able to build that solar installation higher like you see in this picture. And there are really great experiments going on right now, but it's not yet a cost feasible um, technique or innovation from an energy sector perspective. But one thing we heard from the people that we interviewed who are in favor of this option, they saw it as just simple. You just simply lift up the panels and it will be multiple multi-use land and it's going to improve public acceptance and it's a win-win. So I think this is very promising for the future and we should be doing a lot of research to make it feasible. But I do think it's important to set expectations that this is not a technology that's going to be ready tomorrow. So I want to summarize the two overall perspectives we heard from the agri agricultural community in support and opposition of using ag land for solar panels. So um, a lot of the supportive stakeholders argued that in the context of a large amount of agricultural land we have in Michigan, it's not that much of a land use and it won't affect the overall food system. They also tended to argue that private property rights should take precedent over any other sort of consideration. So if a farmer decides that he or she wants to lease his or her land to a solar developer, that should be their own um, right to decide that because they own the land. And then finally, we heard from a lot of farmers that it was very important for them to be able to diversify their farm income because farming is a tough business and a solar lease gives you guaranteed steady income for 30 years. And for our farmers who are getting close to retirement, it does give them the option of retiring and perhaps retiring without having to sell the family farm to be able to retire. So a lot of financial benefits for farmers. For those who were opposed, they saw any sort of prime agricultural land as inappropriate for solar. And they saw instead of this being a private property rights issue, that it was more of an issue with the public value of farmland and also the perception of neighbors in that community. 
a lot of them tended to see that pollinator habitat was kind of disingenuous. It wasn't a real agricultural use of the land. It might be greenwashing. They didn't really trust that it would necessarily come to fruition. So that's an important perception to understand and address instead of assuming it will increase um, improved perceptions. But these stakeholders tended also to emphasize that multi-use land use is a priority to make ag land more acceptable for solar. They also question why isn't solar just going over parking lots and buildings? You saw an example of that um, at MSU in the video. Why do they need to use this farmland? Why can't they use the other areas? So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, I do personally think we should be using the rooftops and the built environment and our parking structures and especially our brownfields. Um, that's also kind of an emerging area where there are a lot of unknowns, but I do think we'll be able to start using some contaminated sites that aren't suitable for other types of development for solar. The challenge with trying to choose just the most marginal agricultural lands is again back to this issue of transmission driving the cost of projects. So every mile we have to go, we add about a million dollars of costs as a general rule of thumb. So if we try to choose the most marginal agricultural land, we may need to site new transmission, which is expensive, and often people don't like to see new siting of transmission either. So it's really important that people understand that we're building this new energy infrastructure and integrating it into our old energy infrastructure. Um, and by old, our transmission line system is still uh, very, there's certainly upgrades to be made, but it's not the aging depreciated infrastructure that I mentioned at the beginning. There's still a lot of sunk costs in it and building more is expensive and visually intrusive. So it's very important that people understand how that transmission infrastructure works when we make choices about where to site solar power. So in conclusion, we found that the agricultural community has very different perspectives on whether we should be using agricultural land, especially PA-116 preserved farmland for solar power. And for some people, the pollinator habitat was exciting and improved perceptions, but that wasn't the case for all stakeholders. We also found there's still a lot of unknowns about how to build a quality pollinator habitat. The designs need to be specific to the sites. Um, there are numerous unanswered questions still about how to design it well. And we have some risks and benefits that if the public understands it will look like one thing or benefit one particular sector and it doesn't, that could really disappoint people. So we need to make sure that that's understood and carefully communicated. So I wanna end by saying that I strongly believe successful pollinator habitat can be built built, but it will take some experimentation and some time. So I want to thank my STEPS, my Science, Technology, Environmental, Public Policy, Capstone students who worked on this, James Madison College's Faculty Development Initiative, who uh, funded the videos, and then Nextera Energy, which funded our Capstone class. Thank you. Okay, we have some questions. Great. Uh, I'll call Matt, and if you can paraphrase and repeat just so people can hear at home. Okay. Uh, so first of all, Jim asks, uh, does dust and pollen affect the solar panels? Uh, do they need regular cleaning? Is that typical? Great question. So the question is whether or not dust and pollen affects the efficiency of solar panels and we ha if we have to clean them often. So in Michigan, we don't because we get so much rain, they just get naturally washed. Um, so that's great. It's a water efficiency for us. In desert climates, like I do part of my research in Morocco, um, in the Egypt, in California, there you do get a lot of dust from the desert environment that you do have to wash off of the panels. Lots of interesting work in how we make that more efficient, how we capture the water and try to reuse it. So great question. Okay, so Kirsty asks, um, as well as using farmland, if everyone put a solar panel on the, the roof of their house, would that be enough to power most of Michigan? Yeah, great question. So the question is, can we avoid using farmland by putting solar on everybody's house? Um, that's a complex question. So the city of Ann Arbor has done a very nice study and they've done a lot of great renewable energy planning and they found that they don't have enough rooftop and brownfield space in their city to produce enough electricity for the city demand. So they plan to do as much as they can in the urban area, which is fantastic. It um, keeps wealth in the community keeps the energy local to reduce transmission costs, 
but they still are going to need to import. And so um, in theory, we should have solar on as many rooftops as we can in uh, kind of from a practical standpoint, it's really expensive. And that kind of moves all of the investment to individual families. So I have a lot of concern about that being affordable to people. But I think the, the methods of financing, the feasibility is really improving. And um, we will start to get there. But I think no matter what, we do need some utility scale solar to make it fast enough to fight climate change and affordable. So great question. Okay, uh, got a bunch more quick time. So Mary asks, uh, just do the solar panels require much maintenance after they've been installed? Yeah, uh, so the question is, do the solar panels require much maintenance? Um, no, they're actually pretty low maintenance. Um, so typically just a couple of people to go through and, and maintenance the site to do some mowing or hopefully in the future to maintain the pollinator habitat. Uh, but the nice thing about solar is you put the costs in pretty much up front and then you have very low costs throughout the 30 years of the power plant. Okay, we've got time for two more. Uh, Ursula asks, uh, where do you see the future of renewable energy in Michigan? I see the future of renewable energy with um, a lot of solar. I think we're going to build a lot more solar and a lot more storage for solar. Uh, I think it's going to be a mix of centralized on uh, large scale facilities and rooftop and home installations. I think we're going to drive a lot more electric vehicles. But what I really hope happens is that we also engage communities, especially marginalized communities, in making those decisions. So it shouldn't be my decision as an, as an academic, as an expert. I can provide the background of you know, what the stakeholders think, what are the benefits and drawbacks. But I also really want to see local citizens engaged in planning their renewable energy futures and also keeping some of that, that wealth and those benefits in their community. Is the $1 million per mile due to losses in the, in the power, or is it due to building all the infrastructure? Mm -hmm. So the question is the $1 million per mile extra to reach transmission. Is that transmission loss, or is that new infrastructure? So it's new infrastructure to build the line to actually connect to the substation or tap the high voltage line. Okay, and I think I'll take another one. I think you partially answered this one because it was essentially from Clay about what does a pollinator habitat site really mean. I know that you went to talk about the bees there, but I guess from that, is it also friendly to other animals living there, you know, mm -hmm. other wildlife? Yeah, great question. So does a pollinator habitat, what does it really achieve? What does it look like? And does it benefit um, different wildlife other than just the pollinator? So it, it does. There's a lot of benefit for uh, birds, potentially for bats, um, other types of wildlife. And it really, it depends on the site. It has to be designed for the specific site and its ecology. And it'll depend what's living around that site. But generally, you're going to get avian benef benefits for avian uh, populations. And you can design different pollinator sites for different types of pollinators. So for our honeybees, it actually could be best to just build a field of clover. It's got a lot of forage for the honeybees. It's very uh, mellifluous. And if we want to go for wild um, bees, then you would, you would grow a much broader range of plants. If you want to help monarch butterflies, then we definitely need milkweed um, to be able to help them to reproduce. So it is really, it's site specific and it's, it's, dependent on what the goals are up front. And that's been one of the challenges about that is we haven't fully acknowledged that, that we need to really think about who do we want, what do we want to benefit, and what is most appropriate for each site. Okay, I'll come in now and uh, thank you. Uh, All right. Can I take the uh, mic off of me? Yeah. Yes. I'll keep my mask on. Okay, so I would just like to thank again Dr. Shalisa Moore coming and uh, giving us a really interesting lecture today, a really interesting talk, and thank you to everyone for your comments as well and the engagement. I certainly learned a lot from listening to it. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining, and we'll see you again in two weeks for another talk in the Great Lake Lecture Series. So thank you very much. Goodbye. Have a nice evening. <laughs>